school. Uh, so, so today, so I will be chairing uh, this morning. And today we will start with the third lecture by Matthias Gavardiel and then follow up with discussions by Bob uh, Knighton and, and Anna Maria Haklariu. So you already know the basic rules. So if you have questions, please use the raise hand option of Zoom. And uh, please, Matthias, go ahead with the third lectures on deriving ads -CSD. Okay, well, thanks very much. So, so let me remind you um, where we got to yesterday, and I'll try to sort of summarize it in a way that uh, maybe makes it a little bit more transparent than what we are doing. So, so the basic idea is that symmetric orbifold uh, sphere correlators, so I, I'll, I'll concentrate. Based, so on, from the point of view of the dual CFT, we are always interested on correlation functions on the sphere because the boundary of ADS3 is a cylinder, so if you compactify it, you get a sphere. So this is the, the correlation function in a 2D CFT, which is the symmetric orbifold. And as I'll try to explain to you, you that's the argument of Lunin and Matur, that you can write this as a sum over all the covering maps, and for each covering map, you get a conformal factor associated to the covering. And there's a prescription for what this conformal factor is, but for the sake of explaining the big structure, I don't want to burden you with all the details. So what is, what is this covering map? So the covering map is a holomorphic map from some surface C down to the sphere. So the, the picture you should have in mind is that here is our, here is our covering surface C. And then we have uh, downstairs, we have the Riemann sphere C infinity. So this, these points Xi live here. And then on the points here, you have a point in the covering surface and what the covering surface means is that once you go around once here, you go around in a W story car park up here. So that's the picture. So this is the covering surface sitting over each point. And what Lunin and Matur told you is that a smart way of calculating these correlation functions is just to invent this covering surface, find this covering map, sum over all the covering maps, and in a multiple, a multiply, uh, the contribution is weighted by the conformal factor associated with covering map, and that gives you a way of calculating the correlation function. So that's the prescription purely in 2D CFT symmetric orbifold. And what's important is that a covering map has this structure, and we'll always come back to that. So that's just the, the, the algebraic way of saying that that's the behavior near this point. Now, the covering surface is in general a Riemann surface of genus D. So this needn't be a sphere. So we have one, this is always a sphere because we are always interested in the sphere correlators of the symmetric orbifold, but the covering surface is whatever it is. So now what's the general basic idea? The basic idea is that that should arise from a world sheet calculation where the, the genus of this covering surface is to be identified with the world sheet, the genus of the world sheet. So the contribution from the covering surface of genus one should come from a world sheet torus. The contribution where the covering surface is a sphere should come from the sphere contribution in string theory. So now let's look at genus by genus. And in the following, we shall mainly concentrate on genus equal to zero. One can generalize it, but let's take this genus always to be equal to zero. I am looking at sphere coverings of the sphere. Now, the idea was that the world sheet correlator should have the structure that, uh, so this is the, the vertex, or the corresponding vertex operators on the world sheets evaluated at genus G. That should be the sum over all coverings, uh, covering maps from genus G down to the sphere X. And the, the claim is that the world sheet correlators have the structure that they are essentially delta functions up to some coefficients that I've just given some name to. And these delta functions are such that they impose the constraint that the zi are such that a covering map exists. And I'll, I'll comment on how this delta function constraint arises in a second. But that's the basic picture. The basic picture is world sheet correlators should be sums of delta functions, one for each covering surface, covering map. And then when you do the world sheet modular integral, when you integrate over all, you see on, on, on the genus zero surface, you just have to integrate over the zs. There are no additional moduli. On the torus, that gets more complicated, but on the world sheet sphere, there's just, you just have to integrate over the appropriate sets. Then this delta function will guarantee that what you end up with is just the sum over the covering surfaces, covering maps, and therefore it'll have the same structure as the dual CFT correlate. So that's the basic picture 
that we want to postulate. Now, obviously, this is a bold statement, so let me try to you explain to you why this has a chance to be true, and then I want to convince you that it is actually true and that this is something we can prove. So, so, so this localization, this delta function seems bizarre. So, so how can one think about this delta function? Now, the delta function, this localization, so when I say localization, I mean the fact that the world sheet correlator is zero except when the delta, when the z satisfies some magic constraint. And the reason why this is very natural is because covering maps generically do not exist. Generic covering maps are a rare commodity. They don't typically exist. If you specify the z's and the x's and the branching ratios, then generically there will be no solution to the covering map problem. Right? There will be no conformal trans there will be no conformal map that satisfies this relation near each of the zi. So how can you understand where this constraint comes from? So so let's take the absurd point of view where we where we ignore the axis. And we start by specifying the Zs and the Ws. So this is somehow not the problem you would have to solve when you solve for the symmetric orbital correlator, because there you are given the Xs and the W. But let's take the opposite point of view. Let's specify the Zs and the W, and let's, for the sake of simplicity, think about holomorphic maps from the sphere to the sphere. So our genus covering surface is a sphere. Now, it's not difficult to see that you can always find a map that satisfies this property, that gamma of z, when you take, so the zi special points, at the zi special points, you have a, there are critical points of the covering map, i, there of this form, there's some number times z minus zi to the wi, and it's not difficult to see that you can always construct such functions. But the problem is that in general, you cannot guarantee that the gamma of the zi will agree with the xi that you were given a priori, namely the positions downstairs. I mean, upstairs you can find zs such that you find such a function, but they will map downstairs to whatever they map to. They may not map to the xi's. Again, maybe that's not so obvious. So let's do the simplest of all simple examples. Let's look at a four-point function where all the branching numbers are equal to one. Now, branching number equal to one means there is nothing there, right? You see, any function has this form. I mean, any function has this form. So this is a function that has no critical points, and it must map the sphere to the sphere, so it must be a Möbius transformation. So as you probably all know, if you give me, if you give me three points xi and three points zi, I can always find a Möbius transformation that maps gamma of zi to xi. But I can only do this for three points. Once I've done it for three points, this fixes the Möbius transformation uniquely. There's no more freedom I have. So then the question is, where does gamma map z4 to? So z4 goes to wherever it goes to. Now this wherever it goes to is either equal to x4, in which case I've found a covering map, or it's not equal to x4, in which case there isn't a covering map. So this is the simplest example where you see that generically the covering map may not exist. It will only exist if the z and the x's conspire to fit together so that you can find a holomorphic covering map. Now, how does it look in the general case? Well, as I said to you, you see, this I can always do. I can always find a function that looks like that near each of these z equal to zi, and I can obviously compose my covering map with a Möbius transformation, right? I mean, I'm free to multiply it with a Möbius transformation. So by doing that, I can arrange that gamma of zi will be equal to xi for i is equal to 1, 2, and 3, because again, the Möbius transformation allows me to map any three points to any three points. So I just compose it with the appropriate Möbius transformation so that the first three points get mapped to the first, to the xi's. The first three z's get mapped to the first three x's. But then I've basically used up all my freedom. And that's true in general for the sphere covering. So then the remaining constraints are that gamma of zi is equal to xi for all the remaining ones. So again, in this case, you're going to get n minus four, n minus three constraints for whether a covering map exists or not. So this makes it plausible, you see, that the world sheet correlator that, we'll, that you would postulate will have a factor of that kind, where by gamma here, I mean this function that I've just defined. This is the function that has this property everywhere, 
and that I've chosen to be of the form that the first three get mapped to the first three, and without loss of generality, I've picked the first one to be zero, the second one to be one, and the third one to be infinity. So it's plausible because that's exactly the constraint that a covering map exists. And if this is true, then you see, you can see that this sort of argument will do the right thing because you see when you integrate that you will just end up with the sum over the covering maps and think about it when you calculate an endpoint correlator on the sphere in strength theory you can fix three points by the Milton symmetry and then you have to do n minus four integrals and you have n minus four delta functions so therefore you would think that everything will just work out fine and you'll end up with the sum over gammas. So this is this is the intuition of what we would like to find. Now, actually, here I'm a, we're a little bit more specific, so we've used some more information, but that is responsible for reproducing a correct conformal factor. So it's not that we just reproduce the sum over covering maps. We produce the correct dependence on the space-time conformal dimensions, but let's not get into that. Let me just convince you that at least you reproduce this structure, which reduces this world sheet integral into a sum over covering maps. Now, again, this is a uh, this is maybe an appealing idea, but how how can you see whether this is actually true or not? I mean, this is a pretty bold statement. I mean, CFT correlators typically don't look like that. So the question is, is this true? And if so, can I prove that to be true? So that's what I want to explain to you in the following. So basically, I have to explain to you three things in order to convince you that this is not just would be nice. That's actually what the world sheet theory dictates for you. And in order to understand how this argument goes, we first have to understand a little bit how a clever way of parameterizing what the, what the covering map problem is. Then I have to remind you of what I explained already last time, what the structure of these world sheet vertex operators is. And then finally, and that will be the key point, to analyze the word identities on the world sheet to prove that we end up with this delta function localization property. Again, I will not give you all the details of the proof, but I'll give you the, the key element of the argument from which I will hopefully, it will be hopefully clear why this has, has a, at least a very high chance of being true. Okay, so, so how do we want to think about covering maps? So again, we are looking at the sphere case, and it was generalized later on to higher genus, and, and Bob uh, and my former student Lawrence, they both wrote uh, the key papers to prove that this also works on higher genus, but here I'll just concentrate on the sphere. So the so, so you can show, and that's really what's called the riemann horowitz formula, that if you look at a covering map from the sphere to the sphere, where you have endpoints that have branching indices wi, then the number of coverings is equal to capital N, which is given by this expression. So for the example I had previously, where we had three-point function of three w's, then this would give you four, this would give you the fourfold cover that you saw. And you can show, furthermore show that in the case of the sphere, the covering map you can always write as a ratio of polynomials of degree n, where n is exactly this number. So this is uh, just the, the, the general way you, in which you can write these covering maps, and you can try it out, and it's, it's a fun exercise to work out some covering maps, and you'll find you can always bring them into this form. Now, it will be useful to think of this in terms of this equation. So why is this equation the same as the other equation, well, you see, this equation just means that p minus of n is equal to minus xi of p plus n plus order z minus zi to the wi. So if you divide this by p n plus and multiply it with a minus sign, then I'm going to divide this by p n plus and divide this by a minus sign, and then you see you just get that this is equal to xi plus order, so this is typically order one, so this will be xi plus order z minus zi to the wi. So this condition is just a rewriting of the condition that gamma behaves as xi plus order z minus zi to the power w near z equal to zi. So I'm going to think of covering maps as being ratios of polynomials that satisfy this matching identity. And that's the identity I'm going to see on the world sheet. But it's just a simple rewriting of the covering space uh, identity, namely the identity that I've written down a number of times before, namely this identity where this is equal to xi. Okay, so this is uh, step number one. We want to think of covering maps 
will be ratios of polynomials satisfy of order n, where n is this number satisfying this identity. Okay, that's step number one. Now, step number two is the vertex operators on the roll sheet, and I think we've discussed this already yesterday in quite some detail, so let me just remind you. So we need vertex operators that depend on x as well as on z. Z is the regular roll sheet coordinate, so it's just the translation operator on the vertex operator valued at z equal to zero, and then the x dependence is simply specified exactly the same way, except you use the, conform the translation operator in the dual CFT, which from the world sheet perspective is j plus zero. So this is just a, a very plausible formula, the natural way of how to define vertex operators um, as a function of x and z. On, this, on the world sheet, it's what you always do, and in the dual CFT, it's also what you always do, namely you just translate by the translation operator of the corresponding dual CFT uh, Möbius group. Okay, so, so these are the two ingredients, and now we have to jump into it. So what we are going to do is we are going to analyze the word identities of these correlation functions. Now there's one small subtlety here, it's, which has to do with that we are dealing with the supersymmetric theory. So as you know, superstring theory is a little bit delicate because you have things like picture changing, you can do it in various uh, incarnations, but picture changing will always come back to you. And the way it comes back to you here is that you need to insert a number of, if you wish, uh, picture changing correcting operators. These are operators that behave like the vacuum, the, the vacuum state with respect to SL2R. So in particular, the right-hand side will not depend on where you put them. The U alphas will not appear but you need them to soak up some background charge. Now, I don't want to go into the details why exactly you need my n minus two, but if you translate the berkowitz rafa witten prescription for how to calculate these correlators, you very plausibly end up with this formula, and that's the formula which we are, with which we are going to work. So for an endpoint function on the sphere, you need n minus two such vacuum insertions, and these are, I think Bob discussed them yesterday in the TA class, these are, uh, 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 behaves like the vacuum with respect to SL2R, but they carry some non-trivial U0 and V0 charge. The Z0 charge is still zero, but you have to compensate some of this U0 and V0 charge, and that comes from picture change. But I don't want to get into this. So this is just what I always mean by this FIS. So I always add uh, these factors when I calculate these correlators. So now how do I calculate correlators of this kind? Now, how do you calculate correlators in a free field theory? Well, what you do is you use the OPE relations. So what you do is you take your, say, symplectic boson and bring it close to a vertex operator and you ask, what's the mode expansion when you bring, say, xi plus near this vertex operator B? So now how, how do you actually do it? Well, so remember, this vertex operator is given by, by this formula. So if you take this operator and move it past the e to the x, uh, sorry, move it past the e to the z minus l minus one, then basically what happens, you just convert z zeta into zeta minus z. That's how it comes about that the OPE will only depend on the difference of zeta minus z. So you have a, the usual mode expansion in zeta minus z, and then you get the modes acting on the state, just like you would how you would write it down explicitly. And I've just spelled it out a little bit more explicitly here in order to stress how this comes about. In particular, you see what's important is that xi plus zeta commutes with j plus zero, and therefore there is no interference from moving the xi plus zero past the e to the x j plus zero, because remember, j plus zero is basically xi plus and eta plus the zero mode, and the only thing xi plus doesn't commute with is eta minus, but it commutes with eta plus and xi plus. So Xi plus is invisible to J plus zero. It just goes through. So then it acts on this state, and then we have to remember what it means to be spectrally flowed. Remember that means you have to shift the mode number down by W over two, and then uh, you simply, that's the formula you get. And if you look at this, what you realize is that this will have a pole of order zeta minus Z you see, the first term that this doesn't vanish is if r is equal to w over 2. So r is equal to w over 2 is the highest pole. So this will go like minus w plus 1 over 2. Right? This is the order of the pole that comes as a consequence of having spectral flow. I mean, normally you would have an, if w is equal to 0, you would have a 
a, a, a 1 over a half pole, because it's in the Ramon sector, in general, you have a pole of order W plus 1 over 2. Okay, so that's what you do when you calculate the OPE of Psi plus. Now, let's look at the OPE of Psi minus. Now, what changes with Psi minus? Well, remember, Psi minus is uh, uh, J plus 0, is still, say, Psi plus eta plus the zero mode, but now there's a non-trivial commutator between Psi minus and eta plus. So as a consequence, if you move this Xi minus zeta, Xi minus of zeta past the e to the xj plus, you also pick up a term that goes like minus x times Xi, the Xi plus field. And then you move them both past them, so you get up, they're both spin a half field, so you get zeta minus z to some power, but in here, you don't have just the original Xi minus mode, you get this correction term that comes from proportional to x by virtue of the fact that this guy doesn't commute with this guy. But you see, I mean, the commutator is very simple. The commutator is just psi plus, so it's easy to work it out. There's only one term. I mean, the higher exponent, once you've done it once, all the higher ones commute, so it's easy to see what you pick up, and you just pick up the linear term from this exponential. It's the only term it doesn't commute with. Now look at this answer. You see, the second term is just minus x time what we had before. You see, this is exactly this answer, right? This answer is exactly the second term, except that we've multiplied it by minus x. And the first term, we, multi we apply the usual spectral flow rule. So remember, this just becomes xi tilde, but now it's shifted upwards. So what we see from this is that the second term has a zero of order z minus zeta. So the first term that survives is r is equal to minus w over 2. So this will have a, a zero of order w minus 1 over 2. So, so if you bring psi minus near this vertex operator, you get minus x times psi plus, plus something that has a zero of order w minus 1 over 2. So therefore, you see, you conclude that if I bring this to the other side, what I learned from this is that this combination near this vertex operator, this just sees the zero of order w minus 1 over 2. So therefore, this is going to be of order w minus 1 over 2. So this is a very elementary calculation. It just follows from working out carefully what this OP is look like. Now, in addition, we know that Xi plus actually has a trivial OPE near the vacuum because it's really the vacuum. And this is something Bob checked yesterday, so in the TA class, but I hope you can just believe me, it has a zero of order one. That's what you find. Okay, so now we just have to put these various puzzle pieces together. So the idea is that we define this at first somewhat bizarrely looking formula. So how is this formula designed? So remember, when we bring psi plus near the w's, we have a zero of order one. Okay, we don't want to waste anything, so we divide by zeta minus u zero, so then we still don't have a pole, we just have a constant term. Now, what happens when we bring psi plus near to one of these guys? Well, remember, near one of these guys, they have poles of order zeta minus z to the minus w plus 1 over 2. So in order to remove the poles, we better multiply by zeta minus z to the wi plus 1 over 2 in the numerator. So this prefactor is just designed in such a way that we don't get any poles. So the numerator removes the poles this thing would have when you bring it here, and the denominator removes the zeros it would have here, but it just puts the first power here so that you don't introduce any pole. Okay, so I can clearly define this correlator. This is clearly well defined, and I think of it as a function of zeta. So this is a fine the function of zeta. So it doesn't have any poles. So, so it's going to be something like a polynomial. So what's the order of the polynomial? Well, let's just count. So we have n fields that go like wi plus 1 over 2. So we get, so you think of taking zeta very large. At zeta very large, you get a plus power zeta wi plus 2 from here. Then you get n minus 2 powers of minus 1. This is this term. And then you get 1 power to the minus 1, because if you take psi to infinity, it falls off as 1 over zeta, because it's a spin a half field, and spin a half field, spin h fields fall off as like 1 over zeta to the minus 2h. 
sorry, one zeta to the minus two h. So this will fall off as minus one. So this is the large zeta behavior of this of this function. But now if you stare at this, you see I have to turn this sum over n minus two into n. That costs me two minus ones. So this turns this minus one into a plus one. And then I can subtract this off. So I get wi minus one over two plus one. And if your memory is very good, you will recognize that this is exactly the order that characterizes the polynomial that appears in the construction of the covering map according to the riemann horvitz formula. Now, if you think about it, you see the polynomials we've constructed actually just satisfy exactly this identity. You see there are polynomials in zeta that have of order n and they satisfy this identity. Why do they satisfy this identity? Well, remember, p minus plus x p plus behaves as order zeta minus z to the w minus one over two. But now I'm multiplying with another factor of zeta minus z to the w i plus one over two. So w i plus one over two plus w i minus one over two just gives you w i. So they behave exactly like functions that so this difference goes like zeta, zeta minus z to the wi as zeta goes to zi. So therefore, these are exactly the polynomials that appear in the construction of the covering. So out of my world sheet correlator, I have constructed the polynomials in zeta that are behave exactly like the polynomials that I need to construct the covering. Map. They have the right order, they have a polynomials, they have no calls, and they satisfy the magic identity that's needed to make them make their ratio into the covering. So in particular, you see, what this implies is that I have this identity. Because, I mean, this is just rewriting this. I bring this on the other side. I use P plus and minus the definition of it. In terms of this, the prefactors are the same everywhere. So what I conclude is that this combination is equal to zero. So this is an identity which these world sheet correlators have to satisfy come what may. But obviously here I've assumed that a covering map exists. Right? Because I mean I've written this formula with gamma, so I've assumed that a covering map exists. But remember, I constructed a covering map effectively as a ratio of these two polynomials. So if the covering map doesn't exist, something must have gotten wrong with this construction. And the only thing that could have gone wrong is that p plus is identically equal to zero. But p plus is equal to identically equal to zero, you can show that if this correlator is identically zero, then also the correlator without the xi plus has to be identically equal to zero. I, you conclude from that that the correlator is equal to zero unless the zi's and the xi's conspire such that a covering map exists, in which case this identity is true. So that's the gist of the argument. Obviously, here you have to be a little bit careful. Here I'm a bit uh, careless. And when you do this a bit more carefully, you can not only show that there are zero, but that there are really delta function localized, and that you get really an identity of this form, which is what I postulated to you earlier on. So this is something we can honestly derive from this world sheet analysis. And I hope I've convinced you that this is a relatively elementary argument. It's just complex analysis keeping track of the analytic behavior of psi plus and psi minus and how they behave when I bring them close to this uh, vertex of the spectrally third vertex of And once I've got that, then by the argument I've given you before, then this integral localizes, becomes a sum over the covering maps and therefore reproduces the symmetric orbifold correlator and I've shown you this argument that gene is zero, and then Lawrence and Bob, Lawrence for the original SL2 formulation, Bob in the free field realization, have shown that this continues to hold that arbitrary genus. So where by arbitrary genus, I mean the genus of the covering surface that appears naturally in this construction. So this is the first principles way in which you can see that these correlation functions on the world sheet really have this magical property of leading to delta functions of this kind, and thereby, in some sense, manifestly reproducing the symmetric orbifold uh, correlation functions. Now, one of the key messages I want you to take away from it, apart from understanding that this is a relatively elementary argument, is that this identity 
also looks suggestive from a different perspective. You see, this looks a little bit like an incidence relation in a twister space description, because you should think of this as basically being equal to x. So in twister space, you introduce some uh, spinorial type variables, and then you think of the space-time variable as being characterized by a relation of this kind. So, so this relation suggests that the right, these variables really want to be twister variables rather than, I mean, so from the point of view of ADS, they're a little bit unobvious what they are, but somehow they seem to want to play the role of twister variables. And this was the inspiration for us for how to generalize into ADS5, which I'm about to explain to you, but maybe there are questions about the ADS3 case. So before I go to ADS5, maybe that's the moment to pause and uh, allow questions about the ADS3 arguments. Well, let, okay. Lucas, go ahead. Yeah, I, I don't understand where this uh, word identity comes from. I think it was too fast for me. Okay, so then I can try again. Okay, so what do you do? So, so when you calculate, uh, when you calculate the CFT correlators, what do you do? You take psi plus, and you take it near to any of the other fields. Right, and you try to work out what is the OPE when psi plus gets to the other fields. Now, when psi plus gets to the other fields, you basically have to write down the, I mean, what would you normally do? You would, actually, let me write this down. Um, so, so normally you would say psi plus of zeta is because it's a spin a half field, you would write this as psi plus of r zeta to the minus r minus a half, right? This is the usual mode expansion you would write in conformal field theory. And then if you take psi plus zeta near some vertex operator evaluated at z, what this would be equal to would be the equal to the sum over r uh, zeta minus z minus r minus a half, the vertex operator associated the arc mode acting on the state evaluated at z. That's a standard CFT description of what the OPE of a vertex operator near a, a, a state or another vertex operator looks like. So this is exactly the formula I've written down here. So this formula is just zeta minus z to the r minus a half, and then I have this acting on this state here. So this is just the way you would calculate this in, in standard way. And now the only unusual fact is that because this is a spectrally flowed representation, this doesn't just have a simple pole, the pole is proportional to the order of W because that's what happens. The positive modes of psi don't annihilate and it's up to the order W over two that doesn't annihilate. And as a consequence, you pick up a pole of that form. So that's what the psi plus OPE looks like. And then for psi minus, the only subtlety is that because you have this E to the X J plus zero term, you have to bring psi minus pi plus E to the X J minus. So if you think about it, it's if you take psi minus of zeta e to the x of j plus zero, what you have to calculate, this is e to the x of j plus zero times psi minus of zeta minus x times psi plus of zeta. Where you simply use the fact that j plus zero on psi minus r is equal to minus psi plus r. So this is uh, this is what this boils down to. So when you bring the 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 psi minus operator inside, you pick up a term that's proportional to psi plus, as well as the usual term pr proportional to psi minus. And because you've spectrally flowed the opposite way, the psi minus now is very regular because you see you've spectrally flowed the other way. So instead of creating a pole, you've created an antipole, which is called a zero. So here you get a zero of order w minus one over two. And for the for the second line, and the first line is just what you get from this correction term coming from x. And now, if you just bring this term to the other side, what you learn from this is that this combination has this uh, this behavior. So, and then from there, we just use complex analysis to discuss the analytic structure of these functions. The analytic structure as a function of zeta, and what we found is that as a function of zeta these specifically arranged amplitudes have no poles, have a specific order, and they satisfy this identity, and therefore their ratio must be equal to the covering. That was the argument. I'm not sure whether that was now clearer or equally uh, confusing. Uh, now no, it's clear. Thank you. Uh, uh. Agu? Yeah. 
I just have a question. If you replace C plus and C minus with eta plus and eta minus in this argument, would you get the same or are there no, etas no, different? No, it's more, that's a very good question. You get, what, what changes is this property. So the way we've set this up, so there's some choice in how you define picture changing and so on. But in our conventions, it's the xi plus that are regular and the eta plus have poles near W and then the argument gets more complicated. And we, there is no simple relation, uh, as far as we are aware. Well, there's some relation to the derivative of the covering map, but it's not as, as simple. But for the purpose of showing that the correlator localizes, it's enough to just look at the combination of the sums. Okay, thank you. Actually, I also had a question regarding that, because, I mean, you, maybe it's obvious, but you were a bit too fast. You said that Xi should have a zero when it approaches W. Yes. But but you said that the argument it's because W is like the identity, but right, so, not, it should not have a zero. This is stronger, right? Right. So, so you're right. You, you caught me in cheating a little bit. You see, W is the identity with respect to SL2R. So it's the SL2R vacuum. Mm -hmm. So with respect to the bilinears, it will behave really like the vacuum. But with respect to the individual fields, it depends. So, so in this convention, with respect to the size, it has a simple zero, and with respect to the eters, it has a simple pole. So that the product has a, has, is regular. So it's, uh, yeah. So I wanted to ask a more general question. So here you, you derive this uh, constraint from these word identities, but often in, in free theories, one can just compute by, I mean, doing weak contractions and exponentiating uh, two-point functions. Is there also a derivation of this kind for this problem? Not as far as we were. And, and, and the main problem is that you're dealing with the spectrally flowed vertex operators. I mean, normally, when people think free fields, they think that every vertex operator is the exponential of a free field. But somehow, I don't know how to write a spectrally flowed vertex operator as an exponential of anything. So at the moment, we don't have a more sort of hands-on way of getting this. The only way we have of getting this is by using the OPE relations, i.e. the world identities. But, uh, but is there a physical meaning, like saying that in a theory of a free compact boson, if you do this kind of construction, what kind of operator do we get? It's, it's not nothing. Well, I mean, these are not the operators you would normally consider because they're not highest rate representations. That is funny spectrally flowed representations. So, because here, according to the I mean, because you need to describe this non-compact ADS space, you need to have an unbounded L0 spectrum. You need to consider representations of the kind you're typically not considering. Also, you're dealing with this symplectic bosons, which are sort of have the wrong spin statistics there. So you're out of the unitary regime anyway. And in this regime, I think these spectrally flowed representations are forced upon you, for example, by modular invariants, by all sorts of arguments. And therefore, you fall a little bit out of the framework of usual free fields. So this is a, a free field theory, but it's a bit more of a not a totally standard free field theory. And, 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 and this is the... Look, I mean, you have to produce delta function localized solutions. I, I wouldn't know how to get them out of a conventional free field theory. So right. maybe that proves that there isn't a simple exponential formula for what this uh, vertex operator is. I think we, are, we were the first to actually ever calculate seriously with these spectrally flowed vertex operators because we understood the techniques with which you can actually get them under control. I, we understood how you can sort of uh, manipulate them like that. On the other hand, I would not be surprised if this is not the final word. I'm sure somebody else would come along with a smarter way of calculating these correlators. At the moment, the best method we have is this OPE method, this word identity method, and, and you should be grateful. The argument I gave you is really the, the cleanest streamlined version I can possibly think of at this moment in time. But the real calculations that we originally did were much more horrendous. So it's, this is already sort of the next generation argument, but I'm sure there will be even better arguments in the future. Thank you. Okay, are there any more There's questions? one more question by Lucas again. Ah, okay. About this picture change operator, is the picture eraser or picture lowering? Uh, well, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, it's. I mean, you have to introduce this. Uh, so, so in this uh, Berkowitz-Rafa written story, there are two G 
I mean, there's, you have to, as always, you have to decorate your vertex operator with the key descendant. But then it is n equals to two theories or n equals to four theories. There are really two different key descendants you can use. And then there's a rule of how many times you have to use one and how many times you have to use the other. And then for n minus two of them, you have to use the other. And they change the u0 and v0 charge. And then you have to compensate it by the background charge of introducing these fields. So this is how this arises in more detail. So it's, it's part of this n equals to two story for how to calculate. And it's not the conventional picture changing. It's the moral analog of picture changing, but it's when you, when you look at these um, papers of berkowitz Waffa and berkowitz Waffa written for how the, calcul the correlators are calculated, there, are, there is a prescription for which of the two G descendants you have to insert. And depending on which one you pick, you get, uh, if you translate this into free fields, a different U0 charge, and that you have to compensate by introducing these uh, vacuum vertex operators. So there's another question by Max, but please, if it's a conceptual question, I suggest it's better to leave it to the end. If it's a clarification, go ahead, Max. Yeah, I, I think it's a clarification question. So um, can you go to the formula between the correlator and the covering maps when, when, when you state the quality, please? You mean this one? No, no, no. Um, the correlator in the worship is equal to the sum of the covering one? maps. Yeah, 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 that formula, yes. So this formula is just for one sector of the closest string or it's for the full closest string? No, this is, this is, these are always chiral correlation functions. So this is, uh, I mean, I'm, I, as always, I'm ignoring the right movers. I'm just writing down the formula for the left movers and there's similar formula for the right movers. So this means that in the end, you have to take the product of both sides, right? Right, so but you then you also have to the, the functions. Or, yes, or but not. on the virtue, you also have to integrate over the Zs and the Z bars, right? Right, but on the right-hand side, you will have two delta functions? That, that's what you're but, saying? Yeah, I think you have, I mean, you have to integrate over the Zs and you have to integrate over the Z bar. Over Z bar, okay, okay, I see. Right? And, I see. And, 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 and it, but you have always n minus four, into, I mean, n minus three points you can fix, so the remaining ones you have to integrate over, and there are as many delta functions as integrals you have to do. Yeah, yeah, okay. Now, now it's clear. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, so, so, so this is uh, the situation for ADS3 CFT2 where I think we have a lot of concrete control. So now we are trying to generalize to ADS5, and this is somewhat more sketchy. I mean, certain things we are very confident about, other things we have understood to a lesser degree, so... So I won't be able to answer all your questions. Some of your questions will be my questions. So, so what's, uh, what's the idea? The idea is that we want to somehow generalize this to n equals to four supernials, and we want to be guided by what worked for ADS3 cos S3. And for ADS3 cos S3, remember, we had four symplectic bosons and four free fermions, and they built the algebra U1, 1, 1 slash 2. And that was the global algebra of the n equals to four superconformal symmetry in two dimensions. Now, our inspiration was that we should try to repeat the exercise in such a way that we get the global algebra U2,2 slash 4, or rather PSU2,2 slash 4, because that's the global symmetry of n equals to 4 super mills. So if you just follow your nose, what this suggests to you is that you should just double the number of symplectic bosons and the number of fermions, and then try to replicate more or less exactly what you've done for ADS3 cos S3. Okay, so what more concretely, what does this mean? So, so previously we had, so, so you should think of uh, one such copy as being what I called previously psi plus minus and eta plus minus. So now we call them lambda alpha and mu alpha dagger. And then we have two such copies. So we have alpha and alpha dot runs over one and two. So we have two plus two plus two plus two. So we have eight symplectic bosons. And then A runs over one to four. So we have four plus four free fermions. And the reason we've written this is because this looks exactly like the components of, uh, of the Twister type fields that Berkowitz wrote down as a proposal for how to get to n equals to four super mills. So we thought that maybe if we combine our insights into ADS3 with this sort of rough idea that almost seemed to work, maybe we can understand how to really connect to n equals to four super mills. So, so these, these are really symplectic bosons, so they satisfy exactly the same commutation relations as before. 
except now I'm writing them slightly differently. Before I wrote them as epsilon alpha beta, now I call them lambda and mu dagger, and then it's a delta alpha beta, but it's really just a relabeling of whom you call what. So these are the, the symplectic bosons, there are eight of them, and here are the eight free fermions. The fermions satisfy as before the standard fermionic commutation relations, and the symplectic bosons are just two copies of what I had before. And as before, what I should be doing is I should be looking at these bilinears, where I pick one generator from the Ys, I1 mu dagger, lambda dagger, or psi dagger, and one generator from the Z, I, I a lambda and R mu or psi. And what you can check is that these generators generate for you the super affine Katsumudi algebra U2, 2 slash 4 level 1. And the argument isn't really that different than for U1, 1, 1 slash 2, it's just basically doubled. And you check that this is exactly what you get. And then you also check that in order to get PSU 2, 2 slash 4 level 1, what you have to do is you have to gauge by the overall U1 field, and the overall U1 field takes this form, which is really the generalization of what we call Z for the case of ADS3 cos 3. Now, part of the reason why we also felt that that was a natural construction is that what this construction of PSU 2, 2 slash 4 is something that had appeared in the spin chain literature before. It's what's called the oscillator construction of PSU 2, 2 slash 4. It appears prominently in Niklas Beisert's thesis, but it also appeared in various papers that try to give some sort of um, good description of the n equals to 4 spectrum. So again, this is not something we've invented. This is something actually quite natural. And what this really is, is just the affinization of this oscillator construction. The oscillator construction just gave you PSU 2, 2 slash 4. Here we get affine PSU 2, 2 slash 4 because we have the fields rather than just the zero mode. But it's basically just the affinization of that construction. And in particular, the zero modes of this will just provide for you a copy of PSU 2, 2 slash 4. And therefore the zero modes will map physical states to physical states and guarantee that everything falls into representations of PSU 2, 2 slash 4, which is what you need for the n equals to 4 spectrum. So that's maybe encouraging you that you are roughly going along the right, in, in the right direction. Now, the new insight, well, so, so Berkowitz looked at these fields, but actually he had to introduce some additional gauge field. In our case, we introduced basically the analog of the ghosts as we did for ADS3 cos S3. So we have no need for introducing an additional current algebra. So for us, these are all the fields. But for us, what's key is that we also introduce spectral flow. And this is, at this stage, just saying, okay, what did we do for ADS3? So let's just do the same thing for ADS5. So half of the modes will be shifted downwards by minus W over 2. Half of them will be shifted upwards by W over 2, such that those that talk to each other get shifted in the opposite manner, right? So the, com the non-trivial commutator is between these two and between these two. So some of them get shifted upwards and the corresponding one gets shifted downwards. Now there is some, there's a bit more logic to why exactly you choose that prescription, but that's in some sense what I would argue is the canonical generalization from ADS3 for what the spectral flow will do to you. So now let's remind yourself what the spectrally float modes do. So remember, so now here it's actually convenient to start with the usual nervous short sector representation and look at spectral flows of that. So let's think about starting with the usual nervous schwartz sector representation. This nervous schwartz sector representation, all the tilde modes are half integer moded, and I'm interpreting it in terms of the untilde modes. So for example, if I look at this relation, you see the, the half mode will kill it. So therefore this means that the mu mode will kill it if R is greater or equal than W plus one over two. And likewise for all the modes that get shifted upwards, and for the modes that get shifted downwards, it's exactly the other way around. If this gets killed for i is equal to a half, so this gets killed if the, for a half minus w over 2, so r must be equal to greater or equal than minus w minus 1 over 2. So this is just exactly translating what spectral flow does in terms of the until the modes, given that I've, I'm starting with the regular Nervous Schwartz representation for the tilde modes. Okay, so, and as before, for the case of uh, PSU 1, 1 slash 2, remember the, the various uh, symmetry generators, the bilinears, they picked up normal ordering terms under spectral flow. In particular, remember J3, 0 had a shift by W over 2. 
So now you can calculate what's the shift of, say, the dilatation operator. Or, I mean, the dilatation operator of super mirrors is really just the zero mode, but of the of the field that corresponds to the dilatation operator of super mirrors. And what you calculate, and I mean, this is just now what once you've specified this, from now on, it's just a calculation. There's nothing more you can do. So now then you calculate that the dilatation operator gets shifted that way. There's a certain asymmetry current, which is the usual asymmetry current, a certain combination of the Cartan generators of SU4, that gets also shifted up by W, and the stress energy tensor transforms in this manner, where exactly the difference between this generator, so this generator and this generator appears. So that's just a consequence of what spectral flow is. So the first thing you notice is that the ground state in the nervous short sector under spectral flow continues to be a physical state. Because you see the ground state is killed by L0 tilde, it's killed by D0 tilde, it's killed by R0 tilde, and therefore under spectral flow, it'll also still be killed because it's, uh, it's, um, uh, it's, uh, it, it, this difference is, uh, is equal to zero. So therefore this will be a physical state, but if you look at its charges, its dilatation charge will be equal to W and its asymmetry charge will also be equal to W as a consequence of spectral flow. So it actually looks exactly like the physical BMN vacuum. So this is again the BMN state that you get upon spectral flow starting with the vacuum. And this is exactly what happened for ADS3. Remember, we got the BPS states with conformal dimension W plus one over two out of the spectrally flowed image. In that case, we started from the Ramon sector, but that's really a minor difference. So what you, what you see is that the ground state, the spectral flow image is a physical state, and it happens to be the physical BBN vacuum. So again, this makes you believe that maybe you're, lo you're along the right track because you're getting at least one state of superhang mills that looks like the right sort of state. Okay, so now we have to bite the bullet. And that's, that's in some sense, the most uh, delicate part of our proposal. That's something where we believe that's the correct description, but we don't at this moment have much more than words. So this is, uh, this is the, you either have to follow me here or you're abandoning me here, but let me try to motivate to you what we propose. So remember, if you translate, remember, look at this equation. I've just repeated this equation and written it out here. So here I've written out all the modes that kill the W spectrally flowed ground state. So now you can ask, which modes do not kill? I, which modes generate the Fox hills? Well, obviously, all those that satisfy the opposite inequality. So for the generators in the first line, I have to take R less or equal than W minus one over two. And for the generators in the second line, I have to take R less or equal than minus W plus one over two. So for every generator, as long as the mode number is less than minus W plus one over two, it'll create something, it'll act non-trivially on the vacuum. But in addition, for the generators of the first line, I also have modes that lie in what we call the wedge. They lie between minus W minus one over two and plus W minus one over two. I mean, at this stage, this is still totally unconverted. I'm just writing the modes that act. So, I mean, this is a Fox phase, right? You have a state, it gets killed by a bunch and the rest just generates freely. So this is the stuff that generates freely. And that's just what it is in this spectrally flowed sector. Now, the crux, the postulate, and this is really a postulate at this stage, is our intuition is that, you see, this ADS-5 theory has basically twice as many free fields as at the ADS-3 theory. The ADS-3 theory has an N equals to two superconformal symmetry on the world sheet. Now, we are bold and suspect that the double theory will have an N equals to four superconformal symmetry. And what we propose is that the physical state condition be to be those that treat this n equals to four as the critical string. I, you should demand that it's critical with respect to the n equals to four algebra rather than the n equals to two algebra. Now, when you demand criticality with respect to the n equals to two algebra, remember the n equals to two algebra is two bosons and two fermions. So the physical state condition will kill four bosons and four fermions because each boson that you impose kills one oscillator and then one oscillator becomes spurious, so you lose four plus four. 
Now, if you impose this for the n equals to 4 critical string, the n equals to 4 critical string has four fermionic generators and four bosonic generators, the stress-energy tensor and the three currents of the SU2R symmetry. So if you follow your nose, you would think that will kill eight bosons and eight fermions. But your Wilshire theory only has eight bosons and eight fermions, so you would, in zeroth-order approximation, think that it will kill everything. And what we mean to say by kill everything is that it kills all out of the wedge modes. All out of the wedge modes are non-physical, provided we have this n equals to four critical strength condition. And then we want to think of this as some sort of uh, generalized zero modes. And also we think we have to do this left and right, but we think that the zero modes are somehow shared between left and right, and we are only going to keep one copy of the zero modes. This is somehow motivated by these people who analyzed, so there's some flux background solutions for this, uh, for these twister strings. And in these flux background solutions, you get exactly these number of non-trivial holomorphic degrees of freedom plus a lot of non-holomorphic solutions. And we think of this as being the generalized zero modes. And what we postulate is that after you've imposed the physical state condition, but we haven't derived this from first principles yet, is that you just retain these degrees of freedom, but you only keep one copy out of the left-right symmetric combination. Now that's the proposal. Now on a certain level, what I would just say is that, okay, we haven't quite derived it, but I'm sure there is some way of defining your string theory in such a way that you retain this. So let's just continue with retaining this and asking what is the physical spectrum that that will describe. Well, okay, that's probably not quite the correct solution yet because we have forgotten about this U1 condition. Remember, we have this U1 condition to go to P as U1, 1, 1 slash 2. It's this condition that we have to set this equal to zero, and obviously we've forgotten about that condition, so this we will still have to impose even after we've gone to consider just these fetch modes. And then we postulated in addition there is something like a Virasoro condition, a, a mass shell type condition. And our intuition is that you should think of this as being similar to what you would get in the BNN limit. So if you ignore the oscillators, the L0 condition would be something like minus two times P minus times P plus. P plus really plays the role of W in this BNN limit because remember the ground state of the, the, the W cycle twisted sector ground state is exactly the physical BMN vacuum with charges equal to W and W. So therefore, if you translate this to the BMN description, this tells you that P plus plays the role of W. And P minus, if you take the formula and you naively go to the tensionless limit, which means you drop this term, just means that P minus becomes an integer. So this is why we believe this is the right mass shell condition you have to impose for the L0 modes. Again, that's not derived from first principles, that's a proposal. Our proposal is that you keep these wedge modes and you impose these residual gauge conditions. And then what we claim is that that reproduces exactly the planar spectrum of free super n mills. Now that statement is something we can prove. So we can't prove that these are the right conditions. That, that's, the, that's where we make a jump where we say, okay, we haven't quite worked out what a physical state condition is, but let's assume that this is it is. If you buy this, then, then we have won. Because now it's relatively straightforward. What you can show is that the Zs, you can really think of as being the Fourier transformed of some position operators. This, so if you define position operators in terms of the modes we've had, the modes run only over the wedge then you can show you get W many position operators that commute pairwise at different positions. And then you can show that this condition is just imposing the singleton representation condition at each side. And this condition just gives you cyclic invariance. So what you end up with is the W fold tensor product of the singleton representation modulo the cyclicity condition. And what this therefore tells you is, you see the singleton representation is in one-to-one -one correspondence with all the derivatives of the free fields of free super mills. So the tensor product of a singleton modular cyclicity are all the traces you can build out of these letters. And that will then match essentially manifestly with the wedge modes modular these constraints that we get from the W spectrally flow picture sector. So this suggests some sort of string bit picture where from the point of view of the world sheet, 
you somehow have string bits, except the string bits are sort of twister valued string bits, and they assemble themselves together if you follow this logic in under spectral flow so as to reproduce the trace with W many letters from the point of n equals the force from terminals. <clears throat> but accounting works in detail. I mean, you can, you can, I mean, this really follows from there. We've also checked it, and there is no doubt that this prescription reproduces the correct single, single uh, trace spectrum of free n equals to four supranials. Okay, so I think my time is up. So let me just uh, wrap up. I think uh, I've, so I spent most of my time trying to convince you that we really more or less nailed this uh, ABS-CFT duality. I think we've shown that the spectrum agrees. I've shown to you how the correlators of the symmetric overfold get reproduced from the world sheet. Um, the, the world sheet plays the role of the covering surface, and while I've only showed it to you for genus zero, um, Lawrence and uh, Bob have generalized it to higher genus, and this seems to imply that this duality works to all orders in one of n. And then towards the end, I've tried to explain to you how this has motivated us to postulate what the natural generalization of ADS5 plus S5 should look like, and modulo the assumption about what exactly the physical state conditions are, we've managed to reproduce the free super and mill spectrum in four dimensions from this world sheet model. And this, we believe, opens the door for a proof of the ADS-CFT correspondence in that context. Obviously, there are many steps to be done. I mean, I think the key step is to really understand how you can describe this quantization from first principles. But I think this is the framework where this has a very good fighting chance. It ties up with all sorts of other natural ideas, and we believe that that's the right way to think about of what the string theory dual of free superangles is. It has some twister description in terms of these fields, and we feel that that is almost certainly the right description. So with this, uh, I'll thank you for your attention, and I'm obviously open to answer any questions. Thank you very much for this inspiring lecture, Matthias. Thank you. Okay, Max was fast. Max, go ahead, question. Yeah, so I have a general question. So um, you, you explained this just for n equals four free supreme meals, right? Yes. So how, how do you introduce interactions, for instance, um, in the worksheet model? I mean, if you want to study the interactions in the CFT sector, how do you tr translate this into the worksheet model? Right. Very good question. So the idea is that you see, you know exactly which operator corresponds to switching on the coupling in the dual n equals to four super mill side. There's a certain vertex operator that corresponds to it on the world sheet. And what you have to do is you have to do perturbed conformal field theory on the world sheet. Take your correlators of your free theory, integrate it against the perturb the, per per the, per the perturbation. And that should produce for you the, say, the lowest order anomalous di conformal dimension of uh, n equals to 4 to lowest order in the coupling constant. Now, given the structure of the answer, you would, so you can try to do this explicitly, but what you would hope, but we haven't done that yet, is that it will effectively reduce again to a, a, a spin chain type description because the world sheet theory smells very much like wanting to be a spin chain type picture. It's also quite sort of natural, you see, these fields, the S fields are really bilinears in this uh, in these twister-like variables. And if you look at, say, the way in the hexagon approach, people calculate correlation function of n equals to 4, they also split up the fields in terms of variables that are separately spinners with respect to the two SU2s. So that looks technically somewhat similar. Then from the worksheet point of view, you would expect that we're going to still have this delta function localized solutions so the, the, the modular integral, you would ex the, the world sheet integral, you would again expect to sort of localize. And the hope would be that that would just reproduce the spin chain description of the anomalous uh, conformal dimension calculation in free super mm -hmm. But that's not something we have done yet. But that's uh, clearly a good, a good thing to try and to do. And that's what we believe should work. I see, I see. Very interesting. Thank you. <clears throat> Actually, let, let me follow up on that, Matthias, because the same question applies to the simpler case of ADS-3. Absolutely. And, and in particular there, I mean, what we really like to understand is how does supergravity emerge, right? How do you go to strong coupling and the world sheet change <clears throat> from this free theory to, to the other theories? To, with, In particular, one, one concrete 
thing that I, it's confusing me is that we we have a description of string theory in a big ideal space as a k with where k is large. Yes. So somehow how can you change the level by doing a, a marginal deformation and go to a, another theory with larger k? Right. So I mean, <clears throat> I think. Uh, so in perturbation theory, you probably can only change uh, k infinitesimally. So I think what we would know to do is how to do this in perturbation theory, how to really go to large volume. You would have to have some more miracle that you not just can do the perturbation theory to low order, but that somehow you can integrate it up. Now, to which extent that will be possible, I don't know. I mean, at the moment, and, and this is a calculation, I think I was asked about this for the case of ADS3. So... That's again exactly what we would we think we should be able to do there. Calculate the perturbation that goes your, moves you away from the symmetric orbit fold from a world sheet perspective, and then you would expect that if you keep doing that, that eventually you would see some sort of large volume background. But that's uh, obviously very very far away. So this this picture is probably good in the string scale size and in a in a neighborhood around it. To which extent that will be a useful description when you go further away, I don't know. But, but remember, you, you, you probably one also switches on Ramon Ramon background, and therefore this continuum will disappear. So there, there are many things that may happen. So we are not entirely sure how this will all pan out. At the moment, we have a, a good understanding of what happens at the free point, and we know in principle how to calculate perturbation theory around it. Just to see if I understand. So in the first uh overview you gave in your first lecture, you showed this conformal manifold where you have this point associated with free theory, which now you have this world sheet at level one. And this has, I think you said 80, right? Um, directions, yes. uh, marginal deformations. And now, should I understand that if I move continuously in this manifold, there will be some other points which correspond to k equals two, k equals three. So it's kind of some special points along this Continuous manifold is that is that the picture? Or? Yeah, I, I'm actually a bit. I'm not a hundred percent sure whether you can really reach other level, other values of k. I mean, that I'm not a hundred percent sure whether you you can reach them. But there's so so. I mean, most of the AT moduli are trivial, right? Because they're just moduli of the T form. So there are only really four interesting moduli, which are the moduli that correspond to moving away from the symmetric orbifold point. And I think they correspond to switching on some Ramon Ramon flux in the in the ADS background. So to which extent you really can see the other values of K, I'm not sure. I mean part of the reason why I'm not sure is that the other values of K you seem to have this continuum. Certainly the other the pure Neve Schwartz, Neve Schwartz background with larger value of K doesn't seem to lie on the same sheet of this moduli space. At least that would be my expectation, because that spectrum looks very, very different to what we see here. So I'm not 100% sure where, whether you would get there. I think what you can switch on is Ramon Ramon flux. I think that's what you can switch on. And you see, Ramon, you see, flux normally is discrete, except in perturbation theory, Ramon Ramon flux is continuous because you've multiplied it with G string, and if G string goes to zero, basically this number becomes a continuum. So I think the the variable you switch on is the Ramon Ramon flux rather than going to different Lewis Schwartz Lewis Schwartz flux. And my suspicion is that you can't reach the other, at least not in any obvious manner, reach the other values of k that way. Uh, Lucas. Yeah, it's related to this last question. Uh, so, in, if you go now to read the Atarcos S5 and just look yes. at Ramon's at Ramon plugs, there is no NS plugs, only Ramon plugs. So, in that case, it could be continuously connected, the K equals 1 to K large, right? Well, so, well, but yes and no. But, I mean, look, if, if you think of this, I mean, on the face of it, you would think there is no Ramon Ramon flux here. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I should say this in public, but I mean, it looks uh, deceptively like uh, the PSU 1, 2, 2 slash 4 of Esomino written type model, which naively you would have said contains one unit of Neve Schwartz flux and zero units of Ramon flux. So probably it just contains no flux. And so here I think there's just one perturbation. There's no Neve Schwartz, I mean, there's no real Neve Schwartz flux here, right? I mean, unlike ADS3, you have Neve Schwartz flux and Ramon flux. 
in ADS5, there's only Ramon flux. So yes. the perturbation, I think, will just switch on Ramon flux. And I think the analog of that in ADS3 is that also the perturbation will just switch on Ramon flux and it will never change the value of the Levy Schwartz flux. And that is, in, sense, in essence, my answer to, to Joao's question because he wanted to ask me how I get to the other value of a different value of Levy Schwartz flux. And I think my suspicion is that they really sit on a different sheet of the modular space. But I, I, I don't want to get into that kind of worms. So there is a at least if you look at this Welsh theory, you would you would expect that you can only switch on Ramon Ramon flux, and that would tie in with what you do here and what you'd probably do on the ADS3 case. Okay, I I suggest Matthias, if you don't mind, maybe you can come to the beginning of uh, the discussion session so that oh. we can really do the official transition. And then we can ask, uh, I still have one more question for you, and I see that there are more questions. And, uh, and we will continue then after the break. Okay, okay. So, so let's just uh, give a big round of applause to Matthias for this excellent set of lectures.